Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan in Ukraine's capital Kyiv, a city that suffered Russian attacks targeting energy infrastructure. Ukraine's electricity supply falls far short of what the country needs. I'm here in a cafe and we'll be talking to the owner about how he keeps the lights and perhaps more importantly, the coffee machine on. And I'm Nastasia Tay here in Doha. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused a global energy crisis. You're watching our special week-long coverage here on Al Jazeera of the Ukraine war one year on. Volatile prices, supply shortages, and economic uncertainty. The conflict in Ukraine has fueled what the International Energy Agency calls the first truly global energy crisis, with impacts that will be felt for years to come. Well, here's how oil prices shot up soon after the invasion. You can see this big spike here in the first week of March, and again by mid-June. That period saw protests from Peru to Pakistan, and Sri Lanka defaulted on its debt. Since then, oil prices have fallen to levels seen before the Ukraine war. Well, let's now take a look at gas prices. Here's the Dutch TTF price that's often viewed as a natural gas benchmark for Europe. You see a surge here in March, another spike here in August, but prices after that also fell back to pre-war levels, helped by unusually warm weather and therefore lower consumer demand. But even those pre-war prices are abnormally high, more than three times what they were just two years ago. The European Commission says COVID-19 supply demand disruptions exacerbated by the war in Ukraine is making these high energy prices the new norm. Well, while Europe's reduced its reliance on Russian gas imports, Moscow is still a major supplier and a significant chunk of it goes via Ukraine. Well, over to Adrian Finnegan now in Kyiv. Anastasia, those deliveries to Europe via... Yes, Nastasia, those deliveries to Europe by Ukraine have continued despite the war. But Ukraine hasn't imported gas directly from Russia since 2015, which means that Moscow can't wield it as an economic weapon. Instead, Russian air attacks have targeted Ukraine's electrical infrastructure. Let's go to Charles Stratford, who's near the bond headquarters of the main electricity company here in Kyiv. Charles, how are people coping with these attacks and what kind of challenges are they facing? Well, Adrian, it's been a stoic effort by the civilian population, of course, who've been so deeply affected by these waves of attacks from Russia using so-called kamikaze drones and cruise missiles hitting or targeting energy infrastructure facilities across the country. The building that you can see behind me, we understand, is a civilian building. It was destroyed in an attack, as you alluded to, to an energy infrastructure facility close to where we're standing. There is another building um, across the road there, a civilian building that was hit, in which we understand at least five people were killed, including a pregnant mum, in these attacks. And they are just a few of the tens of people who've been killed and hundreds upon hundreds that have been injured in these attacks that President Putin says are wholly targeting the country's energy infrastructure. I mean, you can imagine the kind of effect it's had on civilian lives as we've gone through these last couple of winter months, freezing temperatures. We've been visiting areas in the east of the country, some of the areas most deeply affected, people literally having to rely on chopping down trees, cutting wood, using coal to heat their homes. And there are millions of people right the way across Ukraine that are still suffering what are called rolling blackouts. These basically are... It's a situation whereby a given sector of a town or a village will have its electricity cut for a certain period and any day or night, um, whilst other areas of the town keep their electricity, and this rolls through. So as you can imagine, people utilising all the time they can to cook food, to prepare, to charge their, their devices when they have electricity. There have been problems with the schedule as well. There have been complaints by civilians that despite these schedules being well publicised, that the authorities have been unable to, to keep those schedules um, as, as they have uh, detailed. But, uh, yeah, we also know that the government has set up thousands of places across the country where people can go to, as I say, charge their devices and to keep warm throughout the winter months, um, including hundreds of tents 
it has been a stoic effort, as I say, and this year certainly the winter, winter conditions haven't been as bad as expected, but um, there are always the constant prospect of more attacks. Charles Stratford reporting live there from near the pond headquarters of an electricity company here uh, in Kiev. Well, transformers have been a major target of Russian attacks. Al Jazeera's Colin Baker explains now their importance in power substations and why it's difficult for Ukraine to replace, uh, replace damaged transformers. A target stands out among the intense fighting of the last few months of the war in Ukraine. Russian missiles have damaged two-thirds of the country's electrical grid. Many of the strikes targeted Ukraine's transformers, which are unique, vulnerable, and difficult to replace. Ukraine's electricity comes from 15 nuclear reactors, thermal plants, and renewables. Many receive direct or near strikes, and some are occupied. Electricity leaves power plants at hundreds of thousands of volts. That's the most efficient way to get it from the plant to the user. But a house runs at 220 volts, so the electricity needs to be stepped down. And that's what happens inside a transformer. As the power passes between its magnets, the voltage decreases, the current increases, and it becomes useful for a home. After damage, the electrical load can overwhelm stations, as happened in Odessa in February. It's not uh, like a small microchip to be replaced. Um, actually, to replace such an equipment, it is actually, a, a, on the one hand, a huge logistical operation to get this equipment into place. But on the other hand, you have to find this equipment somewhere. Ukraine's electrical grid was built to fit a system that was deployed across the Soviet Union. But Western Europe's grid runs at a lower voltage, so its high-capacity transformers cannot be swapped. The search has turned to former Eastern Bloc countries. Lithuania, which has similar units, donated dozens, including one high-capacity auto transformer. Uh, we do not need compassion, but we need equipment and air defense. Uh, we also need import supplies from Europe and mo mobile generation to support our, our system. Fuel-run generators keep the hospital lights on. And in cities across Ukraine, people have gotten used to rolling blackouts. Colin Baker, Al Jazeera. Joining me now is the owner of this cafe, Honey Confectionery, Stanislav Zavatilo. Now, you've had to invest a lot of money in generators, haven't you, to keep the, the power on and the coffee machines working and the heating. Ironically, you haven't had to use them for the past, what, 11 days? Yes. Uh, seven. Okay. Seven days. Uh -huh. This is how uh, any power switch off. But before this, it was a very big problem for us because we have some generators not very powerful and it was not enough to, uh, all, for all equipment. So we pay and wait for a long time for production because uh, now it's very uh, popular, you know, yeah. to buy generators in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And one of the problems that you have at the moment is a lot of your staff are away fighting on the front line, yes. aren't they? And, and you as a business are, are still supporting them, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. We support them, we buy for them all that they need. Uniform, some uh, radio station, quadrocopters, uh, cables, and etc. that they need. Because they still our workers, you know, and they fight for us. And we must to fight here for them and support them. And you're also supporting the, 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 the conflict or, or Ukraine's effort in the, in the war through the, the cakes that you've, yes. you've got here. This one in particular, I don't know whether you can see that, it's got the, the army insignia on the top of it. It's, it's, a, it's the bar of soap from, from Fight Club. Uh, tell me about that. What, 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 how much of, of the profit from that goes? We make to... this, this special dessert. Uh, for the special program with uh, Sergei Pritova Foundation to renovate some captured um, techniques from Russian and tanks. So we propose for people do not donate for us money, but let us to make the money and uh, sp uh, spend them for renovate this tank. So if you buy this dessert, we take the fixed uh, amount from uh, the price and put on the special account. And after then uh, we uh, um, accumulate this uh, very big sum and pay for the renovation. So we are, renovate are, are one you, tank. Are you able to tell me how much so far? That you, that you, uh, more you... than uh, half million of grivnas. Uh, okay. 
on that on that one on that one cake alone. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Wow, you've got the, the the tank the tank traps. You make all this in house. I mean, you're you're a, you're a pastry pastry chef. This is a uh, this yes. is a family business. And then you've got this one, which is the the, the leopard skin yes. cake. We really which, need uh, these tanks for Ukraine because yeah, it's uh, about leopard tanks, all right. Yes. That's the significance of this. What's what's in this cake? Inside is uh, the Kirsch cake is traditional German cake mm -hmm. and uh, so it's like a twist with Ukrainian cherry so yeah. we told for all people in the whole world we need tank and we will use our uh, best what we are, can make for defend our uh, land so here inside a lot of cherry a lot of vanilla is like our power uh, like we are all Ukrainians like small seeds yeah. in the whole um, Army of Ukraine. You know. Tell me something about the ingredients as well. They're, they're all locally sourced, aren't they? But but you're no longer getting ingredients from Russia or from places that, that support Russia. Is that right? Yes. We don't use any ingredients from countries that support uh, the Russia. Before this, we use Iranian pistachio, but now we don't use it. We use it from United States yeah. and from Italy and not from Iran. No any ingredients from Russia or Belarus or Nicaragua because they have the um, department in Crimea and support uh, the annexation. Okay. So all, uh, all here is mostly Ukrainian ingredients. This dessert is very famous for uh, special local berry. Yeah. We call it um, uh, sunica uh -huh. in Ukrainian, but it's like wild strawberry. Okay. We pick it up in the wild forest. Okay. So the, a lot of uh, women and men in early morning, they yeah. pick up this berry and bring it to the Ukraine. Stanislav, it's, it's great to talk to you. Thank you for having us as, as, as your guest in, in the cafe today. We, we appreciate it. Many thanks indeed. Now, most Russian gas flowing into Europe traveled via Ukraine until the Nord Stream 1 pipeline was completed in 2011. This allowed Moscow to supply gas directly to Germany, but that's been disrupted by the war. As Al Jazeera's Neve Barker explains. Russia has for years been a key global energy supplier. However, after its invasion of Ukraine, Moscow has been accused of using the supply of gas as a political weapon. The centerpiece of Russia's gas is the Nord Stream project, which was designed to guarantee the security of Europe's gas supplies, connecting vast reserves in Russia with European energy markets. But that all came undone when it invaded Ukraine. Nord Stream comprises of two gas pipelines running under the Baltic Sea. Nord Stream 1 runs from the Russian town of Vyborg to Lubmin in Germany. It began supplying gas to Europe in 2011. Nord Stream 2, completed 10 years later, runs from Usluga in Russia. Germany halted its certification to operate a few days before the war started in response to Moscow officially recognizing the breakaway republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. Combined, the pipelines can transport 110 billion cubic metres of gas each year. In 2021, Russia supplied 40% of the EU's natural gas. 55% of gas consumed in Germany at that time came from Russia. But Russia's invasion made that reliance untenable. And in the months that followed, Europe's energy vulnerability was further emphasised when gas flows from Nord Stream dropped to 20%. Russia blamed maintenance issues and faulty equipment. And in late September, four leaks in the pipeline were linked to sabotage. Natural gas was seen bubbling to the surface off the Danish coast. Russia denied any involvement, instead pointing the finger at Western governments. Since then, the Nord Stream project has been at an effective standstill. Well, as you heard there, cheap Russian natural gas has helped power Germany for decades. And Nord Stream would have increased Berlin's economic reliance on Moscow. But now Europe's largest economy is pivoting to others for gas. And it's delayed plans to phase out coal and nuclear power. Dominic Kane reports from Berlin. Nuttertal is a leafy village on the outskirts of Potsdam. This is where Frank Steinsdörfer lives. He's concerned about the environment and the impact of the energy crisis on it. While the solar panels on his roof help generate electricity, it's the brand new heat pump outside his front door, which he tells me will really reduce his carbon footprint. Top priority for me was reducing my CO2 emissions and thereby using less fossil fuels. So it made sense to use my own energy supply sensibly. 
But with heat pumps only in use in around 3% of households here, traditional sources of energy are far more widely used. In recent decades, that's mostly meant fossil fuels from Russia. But the war in Ukraine ended that. With Russian coal, oil and gas imports embargoed, now Germany has built gas terminals on its North Sea coast and signed deals with other exporting countries. At a meeting with the Belgian Prime Minister this week, Chancellor Schotz set out what he and other EU leaders see as the way ahead. The future of our economies will depend on a better power supply from renewable sources and on more electricity, and of course and above all on hydrogen, a part of which we will produce here in Europe, but to a large extent we will also import it. Long-standing EU commitments to phase out fossil fuels meant Russian energy sources would eventually have been phased out anyway. But one analyst says the war in Ukraine changed everything. I believe the invasion of Russia into Ukraine was really a wake-up call. A wake-up call to Europe's dependency on Russia as a country, as well as on natural gas as a source of energy. And I don't think there's a turnaround from the decisions that have been made now uh, to, uh, in, the, in, in the future. And yet, in the short term, Germany has had to prolong the life of its three remaining nuclear reactors, reopen previously mothballed coal-fired power stations and agree to long-term deals with liquid natural gas suppliers. On the face of it, none of these decisions involves renewable sources of energy. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera, Berlin. So, who is Europe turning to as it reduces its reliance on Russian gas? Exports from the US have doubled. The White House has backed efforts to expand exports, but that's angered climate activists. Mike Hanna reports from Washington, D.C. In the United States, it was pain for consumers at the pumps, but joy for the big energy companies. Western sanctions put an end to Russian exports and because of the consequent global oil shortage, the price of gas doubled. The profits of U.S. energy companies soared as they cashed in by ramping up production. Have you noticed Big Oil just reported its profits, record profits? Last year they made $200 billion in the midst of a global energy crisis. I think it's outrageous. The Biden administration eased the oil shortage by tapping into the strategic petroleum reserves. The energy industry had already made its move to increase production. The day after the invasion began, lobbyists sent a letter to the White House. In order to increase production and export, the energy industry asked for major concessions. These included the right to drill on federal lands, swift approval for export licenses, and a green light for some pending pipeline projects. Within days, most of these concessions were granted. Some experts caution against seeing these concessions merely as a surrender to the interests of big oil, pointing out there are also national strategic issues at stake. Some of these things sure may have been motivated uh, by the industry, but a lot of these are just strategic considerations on a national level as well. Um, particularly with regard to energy supplies to Europe, things of that nature. Um, you know, there, there are multiple moving parts here. One of these moving parts is the U.S. liquefied natural gas, or LNG, industry. The U.S. only began producing LNG six years ago, but it's already a leading exporter alongside giants Qatar and Australia. Environmentalists say that comes at a price to the environment. While LNG has been promoted as a bridge fuel that burns cleaner than oil, they insist the amounts of methane produced during the fracking process pose as great a threat as the production and use of fossil fuels. LNG exports will swell the already handsome profits of U.S. energy companies. These can and will be quantified, but the human cost of the war that contributed to these profits is beyond measure as is its impact on what the U.S. administration called its green policy to combat climate change. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Washington. More now on how Western sanctions are affecting what Russia gets from exporting oil. Back to Nastasia in the Doha studio. Well, thanks very much, Adrian. 
Uh, Russian crude now sells at a discount compared to global benchmarks. But that also means that Moscow is selling more oil. So who's now buying it? And before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, nearly half of all of its oil exports went to the EU. As Western nations imposed sanctions and restrictions, Russian oil has poured east. By the end of 2022, the EU is buying just over a quarter of Russian supplies. The UK and the United States, which had taken 9%, quit buying it entirely. Now, to fill that void, Russia turned to Asia, offering oil at steep discounts. China was an eager buyer, and its share of Russian supplies grew from 21 to 25%. But most notable has been India. It went from importing nearly nothing from Russia to buying a record amount in December, 33 times as much as the year before, with an average of 1.2 million barrels a day. Russia is now India's biggest supplier of oil, and analysts say that's only going to increase. Well, Katrina, you reports now from Beijing on how China is benefiting by importing both Russian oil and gas. China and Russia may not officially be allies, but they increasingly appear to be marching in step. One year on from the invasion of Ukraine, Beijing continues to tout its partnership with Moscow as one without limits. And joint military drills like this one have become commonplace. China and Russia relations have maintained a healthy and stable momentum of development and cooperation in various fields. And this has yielded fruitful results. One of those fruitful results is a potential upcoming trip by President Xi Jinping to Moscow in spring. The Chinese leader counts Vladimir Putin as a close friend, and the two have met in person 40 times, including in Beijing, days before Russia attacked Ukraine in 2022. But there's more to this than just friendship. Western sanctions have prompted trade between Russia and China to soar, especially in energy. Moscow is Beijing's largest supplier of oil and a major supplier of piped and liquefied natural gas. China really is a big winner in terms of having more access to cheaper now uh, Russian gas and Russian oil. There's also a realization in Beijing that because it does really have the upper hand now in terms of you know uh, a source for of investment for Russia. Uh, that it can more or less call the shots. Despite providing Moscow with significant economic support, Beijing insists it's neutral when it comes to the war in Ukraine. It's called on the two sides to engage in peace talks. But U.S. researchers say Chinese state-owned firms are providing Russia with sensitive technologies to equip its war machine. The data explicitly says that these parts are, are being sent to Russia for the use of the um, S-400 and M-System helicopters. So we know that they're very clearly stated for that use. We also understand that in general, this bilateral trade is growing. And so we believe that there might be some, some connections in both China's effort to bolster its military capacity, as well as Russia's effort to bolster its military capacity with Chinese goods and parts. Beijing calls these claims hyped up fiction and says its ties with Moscow are based on non-confrontation. Beijing's refusal to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine has frustrated Western attempts to isolate the country. Experts say international focus on the war has proved useful for China, providing an ongoing distraction from its own military activities in the South China Sea and around Taiwan. Katrina Yu, Al Jazeera, Beijing. Well, let's now bring in Mikhail Krutikin. He's a co-founder of the oil and gas consulting firm Rus Energy. He joins us now from Oslo. Mikhail, as we've been hearing, Beijing and Moscow appear to be getting very close, but its increase in oil and gas purchases can't quite take the place of Europe, it seems. No, I do not think uh, China is uh, prepared to replace Europe as the market and niche for Russian natural gas. There is only one pipeline that connects Russia and China. It is called the Power of Siberia. It is going to reach its nameplate uh, capacity in 2025 only. It will, it will be uh, 38 billion cubic meters a year. And uh, this is not replacing Europe, where Russia was uh, selling about 155 billion cubic meters a year before the war. 
and uh, China is not prepared to give uh, permission for another uh, major project of uh, Russia's Gazprom, Power of Siberia 2. Uh, uh, well, Russia insists uh, that uh, uh, there will be a pipeline across Mongolia into China, but China, um, well, apparently does not need it. Uh, it can mm. uh, satisfy its gas uh, demand with uh, gas from other sources. And uh, I, uh, even if the permission is given, it will take about 12 to 15 years to build such a pipeline. So it's not going to replace Europe. Sure. Well, in the interim, though, with the sanctions and restrictions, we have seen already huge drops in revenue for Russia. How has that impacted the Kremlin? Does it change the political calculus the way that the West wants it to? Well, basically, when we look at the results of the first month of this year, in January, uh, the Russian federal budget uh, uh, lost about uh, 30 percent, so even 36 percent of its uh, revenues. If we look at the oil and gas revenues separately, it, uh, we would see that uh, about 50 percent of those revenues have been lost because of the sanctions. We, even when we listen uh, to some rumors about some shadow fleet of Russian tankers uh, delivering uh, smuggled uh, oil to uh, overseas uh, 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 consumers, we uh, in the final run we see that the sanctions are working and the Russian uh, deficit is experience uh, is experiencing great problems. Uh, Russia is already selling part of its uh, currency and gold reserves. Russia is asking huge companies such as Gazprom and oil companies just to give some money to the budget. Uh, uh, well, without uh, referring to any mm -hmm. tax rules or ta taxation, it's just gifts from the companies. Sure. So there will be a huge uh, shortage of cash. Uh, Mikhail, very briefly, you're saying that Moscow is trying to replace the revenue, but I'm curious whether any of this is having the political impact that the EU and, and the US wants. Yes, basically, uh, the Russian econ economy is going to suffer very much. But we see that uh, the same budget, the Russian budget, increased its uh, uh, spendings mm -hmm. on the war about 60 percent. So I think the Russian government is not going to pay any attention to the economic problems mm -hmm. and is going to continue the war. Very interesting. Well, thanks very much there, Mikhail. We'll have to leave it there. That's it from me, Nastasia Tay, on the global energy crisis. But do make sure you tune in tomorrow, same time, 11.30 GMT on Monday, February 20th. Our environment editor, Nick Clark, will be exploring how the war has been a major setback in the fight against climate change.